All right, Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 14 through verse 30 for our, for our study tonight. Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, and, he, and being glorified of all, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the, to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now we're going to stop there. Because the latter part of the text, it will deal with what we'll deal with that mainly on Sunday. But we see four things in this passage. First, we see the power, then we see the place, then the preaching, and then the persecution. So we're going to look at those four considerations. Remember that Jesus, so far in his life and ministry, we have seen him go through the preparation stages, the baptism, and then the temptation in the wilderness. And in Luke's account, this event is given right after the temptation event. But from John and others, we know that he had gone back to Cana. Then he did the first miracle there. They came down to the Passover and there cleansed the temple, then met with Nicodemus, and then the Samaritan woman in John 4 went back, and we saw last time, last time that we studied this, where he healed the nobleman. Now, this passage, there are different theologians who put it in different places in the life and ministry of Christ. For Luke, he sees it as important to choose this time that he was teaching in a synagogue to show this. It's the first time anywhere in the Gospels that he is recorded as teaching in a synagogue, although the text clearly reveals that this was a regular practice and habit for him on the Sabbath day. So as he comes in, this is a significant passage, and some will, Ryrie places it a year later, but most likely from the different ones I've compared, they all seem to put it right at about this point in his ministry. Remember where we are. He's been through the first Passover of his public ministry. And we're between the first and the second Passovers. And we'll come to that in fairly short order. So let's look here at the first part of the passage. At, first of all, the power. Now it's interesting, I like what J. Vernon McGee said as he was considering the first part of this passage. That, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. You know, when he pointed out this, when you go through temptation, temptation will do one of two things to us. When we are tried, our faith is tried, whether we'll be faithful to the Lord and his word or not, it will either soften us or it will harden us. It will sweeten us or it will make us more bitter. And we can see as we look through history and you look through people that we have seen that God has allowed to go through trials and temptations and some come out in those ways, some sweeter and softer, others come out bitter and hardened. Yes, they, they knew the Lord, but they, re, they responded differently. And one of the things he pointed out was the same sun that will melt wax will harden clay. The same sun that will melt the wax, it hardens the clay. So is the issue with the sun or is the issue with the elements? The issue is with the element. And that's the same thing. The issue of whether we become softer and sweeter or harder and bitter has to do with our heart and how we perceive and go through this, this temptation 
as opposed to blaming it upon the temptation and God who allowed it in our lives. In fact, there's nothing that comes to our lives that God has not allowed if we belong to him. And that means that if he allowed us to go through it, then we are able to not only go through it, I'm thinking in Portuguese now, but not only to endure it, but also to find a way to escape it. In other words, to remain faithful. So as we come, that's, when did the Spirit come upon Jesus? Now you say, I thought the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, why is Jesus going in the Spirit? Isn't that redundant? Well, remember, that there's one God expressed in three persons, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No man has seen the Father at any time, the Bible tells us. So the Father, to whom Jesus prayed, he sent the Son. He became man, and when he became man, he laid aside the independent exercise of some of his attributes. What were some of those attributes that he laid aside? Well, omnipresence is one of them. And there are many of those that he chose not to exercise in and of himself as the second person of the Trinity. So how did he do them? He still did miracles. He did all these things. How did he do what he did while he was on the earth? Well, the answer to that question is in the Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. What happened the day he was baptized? The heavens opened up and the Spirit of God descended upon him as what? In the form of a dove. And it came upon him. Then you see chapter 4, verse 1 of Luke. It says, And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Now where do we see that passage next, full of the Holy Ghost? When you get to the book of Acts chapter 2. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost full of the Holy Ghost and he preached to all Jerusalem that you have crucified the King of Glory. So Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned to Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And that was to be tempted. So he followed, the, he went in the, by the, uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And here he's going in the power of the Holy Spirit in verse 14. So let's remember, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer? Now, the Lord Jesus was God, but he was now the God-man. He took upon himself the form of man, placed himself under those limitations, tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So what was the role of the Holy Spirit? Well, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth. So you see from the beginning, and just like a believer, we are conceived in the sense of spiritually by the Holy Spirit because apart from the Spirit giving us life and bringing us to life spiritually, we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are dead spiritually at the moment of birth. Alive physically, but dead spiritually. And unless the ministry of the Holy Spirit steps in and gives us life, he seals us into the body of Christ. That means he takes us, he baptizes us into the body of Christ not by water baptism. This is the baptism of the Spirit. Water baptism is an identification that happens later. But we are baptized into the body of Christ, placed there by the Holy Spirit himself. And the Bible says we are sealed by him unto the day of redemption. Which means that, remember the study way back, going back to probably the first year that I was here. I asked you if you were a, a monkey Christian or a cat Christian. And as much as I dislike cats... And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, a baby monkey, how does it get around? It holds on to his mama, right? It depends upon his ability to hold on tight. The kitten, when they are carried around, it's, it doesn't depend on the kitten's ability to hold on. The mom simply picks it up by the nap of the neck and carries it. It just hangs there, you know. And that's the way we are when it comes to Christ. It's not by our works that we hold on to Christ and we must secure our own salvation. It is by the finished work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in us that permanently seals us into the body of Christ. Now that is the, his role in our lives. As a result of what Christ did on Calvary, that's now the ministry of the Spirit to us. But it doesn't end at salvation. Romans 8, 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. So if you're saved, the Spirit of God is living in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's with you 24-7. Where you go, what you see, what you do, what you say, he is there. 
So we need to start thinking in those terms. And when we think in those terms, and all of a sudden our lives take a different perspective, when we realize that the third person of the Trinity is living in me. Well, that's having the Spirit of God. Every born-again believer, whether he's living for the Lord or not, if he's truly born again, the Spirit of God is living in him. That's a sobering thought. But then we have this expression that we see in, in the beginning of, verse four, of chapter 4, verse 1, being full of the Holy Ghost. And we see Paul full of the Holy Ghost, Peter full of the Holy Ghost. In fact, it, Paul says in Ephesians 5, 17 and 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? To not be, don't be controlled by any other substance like wine or anything else, but you be filled or controlled by the Spirit of God. That's what it means. When we're filled with the Spirit of God, we yield the control of our lives to Him, and He is free to do through us what He wants to accomplish. And so that anything that the Lord Jesus did while He was on earth, He did under the instructions of His Heavenly Father and through the power of the third person of the Trinity. So the entire Trinity was involved in all the acts and works of the Lord Jesus on earth while he was serving. So what power does he go, did he go into these places? Did he preach these things? And this is kind of a summary of his life and ministry, this whole passage is. He did it in the power of the Holy Ghost. Now I've had people say to me from time to time, they said, you know, if the Spirit of God is living in me and His power is supposed to be manifested in me, it says, there must be something broken because I don't feel it. I feel kind of weak or powerless and it seems like my prayers don't go beyond the ceiling and I can't seem to accomplish anything for the Lord. Well, sometimes that's because either unconfessed sin in our lives, a lack of yielding to the will of God, or it can be that we're not saved at all. Now, the person will know, because when we're saved, the Bible says the Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit that we are a child of God. Well, he sets an example for how you and I are to go through the Christian life, how you and I are to serve him, not in our own knowledge, not in our own expertise, and not in our own power, but in and through the power of the Holy Spirit who is working in us if we yield ourselves to him. When we, you know, Jesus told them in John 15, he says, without me, you can do what? Nothing. But yet, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And the only power that Paul had to do that was through the power of the Holy Spirit, who now indwelt him because of what Christ did for him. So that's the pattern for our lives. The Lord Jesus himself, during his earthly ministry, though he was God, he was man. The God-man, 100% God, 100% man, and I don't fully understand all that union, but it's there. The Bible clearly teaches it. Jesus taught it. And that being the case, how did he set an example as a man for us to live through our lives in service for him? You do it by the power of the Holy Ghost. You don't live by your own power. You live by his. So Jesus returned by the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Now, on your map there, if you'll look on the front page, Israel's divided into three different portions. You have the northern part, the central part, and the southern part. Northern Israel, that region is called Galilee. You have the Sea of Galilee, but the whole region is named after that. And then halfway down, you have Samaria. There's a, a town or a city of Samaria, a pretty large city. But you also have the region was known as Samaria. And we talked about the Samaritans and why the priests and the religious leaders, at least, avoided at all costs going through Samaria to northern Israel. But then we have in the southern part where Jerusalem is, and that's called Judea. So when he says he goes to Samaria, goes to Galilee, goes to Judea, that's talking about the general regions of the country. And then he will name towns and things like that. So as we look at this, the, th the place, I want you to see three different places. We'll go from general to specific. Generally, he's going into the region of Galilee. Now, he's gone back. We already saw where he went through Samaria. He's already back there based on what we saw in John chapter 4 when he healed the nobleman's son. 
Was that before or after this event? The Bible doesn't tell us. So he's in the region of Galilee. Now, as I was sharing with Brother Junior and Sister Ruby while ago, it says, have you been, where, where are you going on this map when I go over to the Middle East? Well, where I would be going on the, on the map on the, which one was it had Phoenicia in there? Well, the front page, I think. No, it's the one on the right page in the middle. There's, as you go up, is Ptolemais in that area? That is the area where you will find uh, uh, Beirut and those, those particular places. But this, when you go into this map and you're going, Jesus goes up to the area of Galilee. This is where he was brought up. But it referred to him as being from Galilee. Now, we know that Jesus was not born in Galilee. Where was he born? He was born in Judea, in the town of Bethlehem. But his parents were from Nazareth. Now, that brings us to that. And we're not going to go a lot into the area of Galilee because we're going to see that a lot throughout his ministry. If you look around the towns there on that map that says Galilean ministry, this is where he'll feed the 5,000. This is where the Sermon on the Mount will be preached. And so many of the miracles and events in his ministry, that's why many will call this the Great Galilean Ministry. But basically, that's the northern part surrounding the Sea of Galilee there in Israel. But we come to the more specific aspect. If you look where Nazareth is, just a little bit lower part of the Sea of Galilee to the left, this is where he was brought up. And if you'll recall back when we were talking about the birth of Christ and we described what Nazareth was like, to say someone was from Nazareth was not a compliment. They were not known as the most honest people. They were not known as the most reputable people. They were not, it was, this was not known as a place from which you would want to be. In fact, you will not find Nazareth mentioned in the Old Testament or by most Old Testament his, historians. So it was not a place, and Jesus, when he was referred to throughout all of his ministry by many Jews as Jesus of what? Nazareth. That was not a complimentary title. It's like they continually wanted to remind him, we know where you come from. We know where your father was from. You're just a carpenter, which is a way of saying you're a peasant. You do menial work. And you're from Nazareth, which means you come from a a nondescript, a, a, an undesirable place, as opposed to Jerusalem where the temple was and where all those who taught the scriptures and things, that, that's where the focal point of the Jewish religion was around the temple in Jerusalem. So Nazareth, this was his hometown. And this event that we're looking at here in this passage is going to bring us to a point in his life and ministry that is going to be a changing point because of the rejection that will take place in the latter part of these, of what we read, not we haven't read it yet, the portion from verses 20, 22 and following. They're going to look at him and kind of say, well, you know, you come in here preaching to us. He's going to quote Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, all but the last phrase. He's going to stop his reading of the scriptures where in the English language we have a comma, not a period. It's not the end of the thought, but he stops there because that is the part of the scriptures that are being fulfilled in front of them that very day. But that powerful message, and he then identifies and he sits down, he tells them, the scripture is being fulfilled in front of your eyes. And they respond, they say, aren't you Joseph's boy? We know you. We saw you grow up. We know where you're from. And they despise him. They reject him. In fact, they try to kill him. He goes back to his, the first time in Scripture that it's mentioned, he goes to a synagogue and he teaches, though it, it's been happening from what we understand over time. And we'll see that in, when we look a little bit at his teaching and preaching. But he said he taught in their synagogues throughout Galilee, being glorified. That means he was being praised of all for his teaching and the manner in which he taught. And he comes to Nazareth, verse 16, where he has been brought up, and as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. But unlike before, rather than sitting back in the back, not with the teachers, not with the, the elders, so to speak, of the synagogue, 
He was just one who attended, but now he comes in and he's one because he was known for teaching. He's going to be one of the teachers. But understand that his town of, the town of Nazareth was his place of upbringing. As we mentioned at the wedding at Cana, his father's not mentioned. In fact, he's not mentioned again in the life of Christ. So the assumption is that by this point, he is probably, by the time of the wedding at Cana, he, his father was probably dead. So as he comes to his hometown, his hometown is going to reject him. But he comes there on the Sabbath. He goes to the synagogue. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at the synagogue. What is a synagogue? Somebody asked me that some time back, and I, and I told them, I said, you know, I'm going to have to go back. And I said, I know it's where they met to worship, to study the scriptures. But I said, it's not a temple. They, said, they asked, what's the difference between a synagogue and a temple? Well, let's, let's try to answer some of those questions to see if we can clarify. And the reason this is important, that we understand this, is because throughout his ministry, he will be tied to synagogues here, left and right, everywhere he goes. And you're going to find some of the greatest opposition coming out of the synagogues. Later um, in the book of Acts, the apostles will go into synagogues. Every time they come to a new town, they'd go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And there they'd often be invited to speak, to teach. And you'll understand why in a few moments. So it became a central point. In fact, many of the New Testament churches were born out of synagogues. Some of the Jews would believe, they would come and they would meet with Paul or Barnabas, Silas, Peter, and the different of the apostles, and churches would be born out of that area, and they began worshiping on Sunday, and the church was born and moved on. But they're distinct. Synagogues are distinct to the Old Testament economy. They're distinct to the Old Testament law. And so they are not, though you will see them all over the place today, they are not, they do not focus. Those are usually those who have rejected Christ as the Messiah. They're still focusing on the Old Testament scriptures. So what, what is a synagogue and what was its function and its purpose? Because it was a major aspect and a, quite a venue through which Jesus was able to teach. All right, let's look at the one here in this passage is the synagogue there in Nazareth. Now, the word synagogue, it means in the Greek, the place, the gathering place or the assembly of people. So it's, it sort of has the same meaning as church. What does church mean? The assembly. That's what it refers to when, when we come together, it, we're an assembly. Now, the, the purpose of the church, the, the body of Christ, that, then it goes into the organization and structure. Well, Similarly, the synagogue became known as the, the place of the gathering of people, the assembly of people. Now, it's also known in different places as the prosuke, which is the, the house of prayer. Many customs, for example, in Upper Egypt, they found a synagogue clearly tied back to Jewish people. They were in Egypt. But those that were there, they called it the house of prayer, not a, not a synagogue. So where did they come from? Well, they come from, most likely, that you'll find different opinions. Some will tie it as back far as the Babylonian captivity. What happened during the Babylonian captivity? Remember, the northern ten tribes had already been taken by Assyria. Now the Lord is punishing the southern two tribes for their disobedience, and they allowed them to be carried off by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon as captives for 70 years. Now, what also happened in 586 B.C. was the temple was destroyed. Now, you don't have a temple. Remember, the temple was the central, the center of the life of Israel because that is the dwelling place of the Lord, the, the Holy of Holies. That's where the, chose, the place that he chose to establish his name among his people, as we saw it in Deuteronomy. So when the temple's destroyed, where do they go to offer sacrifices? Where do they go for all the, th the role that the temple played in their lives? And the answer was they couldn't. While they were over in Babylon, they couldn't go to a temple, and that was the only place that God had ordained where they could go and offer sacrifices. So all the sacrifices, all the feasts, and all those things ceased 
when they were taken out of the land. Remember when God said in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, I will destroy you from off the land? He did. He took them. He says he didn't wipe them off the face of the earth. He simply took them out of that place. And the purpose for which he chose them and brought them up and gave them that land was no longer being fulfilled. So they were out in captivity for those 70 years. Now, while there, we're going to find that in Ezekiel, and I think I've got some chapters listed here. Ezekiel chapter 8, chapter 14, chapter 20, and chapter 33 will describe times when there would be Jewish exiles that would get together with Ezekiel and he would teach them the word of God. So these would be gatherings. They were in places often outside the promised land where Jews could get together. Now to have a synagogue, you had to have at least 10 Jewish men. So you had, there had to be at least 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. There would be a building usually built out of stone and sometimes someone would offer and build it for them, or they would get together and build it. But it would have usually a meeting room, a gathering room, where they would do the reading and teaching of scriptures. And we'll talk about the order of service in a little bit. But it would be in a, some towns, larger towns, would have more than one. In the area of Galilee, as you look at that map about the ministry in Galilee, it shows a few towns on that map. But the truth is, according to, I believe it was Josephus, he said there are 240 towns, villages, or cities in the Galilean region alone. And most of these would probably have at least one synagogue. So when it says there in, in verse 2, not verse 2, sorry, verse uh, 15, that he taught in their synagogues, this, he had plenty of places, and throughout that first entire year, year and a half, that's where he would be and speaking and telling every opportunity he had about the mission and the message for which he was sent to earth and to preach to mankind. So these synagogues, ten Jewish men, they, that was the, ba the minimum they could have in order to form one. Now, as we talked about, what is their relationship to the temple? These synagogues are all throughout the land, one in every town. Well, how many temples were there? Just one. There could only be one. And that was the place, as, as Moses described it, the place where God shall choose to place his name there. And that was in Jerusalem. Now, the synagogues, as they were built, they would all be built in such a way that they faced the temple. Wherever they were, if they were in the southern part of Israel, south of Jerusalem, they'd be facing north. The ones in the west would be facing east toward the temple. Wherever they were, they faced them so that every time the reader of the scriptures would stand up, he would be facing the temple. When they left there, they would be going toward the temple. That was just the way that they were designed. So the, in the absence of a teacher, let's talk about the structure for a moment. These didn't have a full-time preacher or teacher assigned to them. A local church has two offices, a pastor and deacons. But a synagogue did not necessarily have that type of structure where you had a full-time teacher. Many did not even have a full-time priest or a priest that would be assigned to that area and would attend that synagogue. Many did. You remember the Levites are spread out throughout the land? But not every synagogue would have a Levite in the synagogue itself. So what happens is we, have, we come to the structure of it. And the Bible, you'll find two different groups, two different people that are mentioned in the structure of a synagogue. One is the ruler of the synagogue, and in some passages you'll say the chief ruler of the synagogue. Some will say rulers of the synagogue, plural. So in larger towns, maybe they had a larger group and they had more than one ruler. These would be the elders. And their role, they were not necessarily the teachers. But they were responsible to vet the teachers and to assign the reading of the scriptures to who would be doing it each Sabbath and who would read the prophets each Sabbath and then who would teach. And of course, there would be other aspects that we'll look at in just a moment. But his role was to care for the building, make sure it was open and prepared to make sure that those that were there to lead the services on the Sabbath day would be there. And then they had a second 
uh, officer there besides the ruler. And that's called the, he was called the Shazan. This is one, in fact, in verse uh, 20 of our passage, it says, And he closed the book, that's the, the scroll of Isaiah that was given to him, and he gave it again to the minister. This would be the Shazan. This is one that, he's the lowest one in terms of ranking there, but his duty was to take and care for the scrolls, to take them out of their keeping place. Usually they would be kept in a covering and inside containers that would protect them. And when they, he knew what the reading would be, see, the reading of the law, that's the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We've been studying, well, going back several years now. That, that's the Torah. And they had a, a scheduled reading of that over a period of three years to read through the entire Pentateuch. So that would be one part of the reading. And he would be, he'd know based on the date, based on the time in that three-year cycle, he knew which scroll would have to be pulled for that reading. But then the reading of the prophets would not necessarily be on a particular schedule. And based on what the reading would be, he had pulled that scroll and have it ready for the reader to read it. So that would be, those are the, the structure. You have one who kind of looks over the leadership and the facility. The other one cares for the scriptures themselves. Not everybody had a Bible like we do. So they would come and they would read from those scrolls. But also during the week, different activities would take place. And the Shazan would be responsible to oversee the instruction of the children. They'd be brought and they'd be taught in the scriptures. Remember the Jewish boys they would generally learn the Torah by the age of 12, I believe it was. They, they could quote the first five books of the Bible. Now you talk about knowing their scriptures, by the time they're age 12 and they're ready to become a man, they knew the word of God by heart. So when, they, when Christ and the apostles and different ones refer to certain events that we have to go back and research, they knew immediately in their mind exactly what he was talking about. When he quoted from Deuteronomy so many times, they knew exactly what he was talking about. So they had that point of reference. Well, then they have the order of service. What was the order of service? Well, based on several different sources that I've looked at, it would include, at the beginning, thanksgivings or blessings spoken in the connection with before and after, the Shema. Remember what the Shema is back in Deuteronomy chapter 6? In chapter 5, it's a reminder of the Ten Commandments. In chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That would be read every time. And it would include a reading of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 15, 37 to 41. That's kind of the opening of their service, reminding them why we are here. When we come to church, why do we come? We come to remember that the Lord our God, He is one Lord. He is the reason we are here, and we are here to worship Him, not to please ourselves. Then, then they would have prayer, and this would be kind of a benediction type prayer, to where the one, if it was a priest there, he would do the prayer, and the congregation would respond with Amen. Remember how we did in that, when Moses placed them on the two, two banks, and they were in the valley, and the, he would re, they would read, and the congregation from both sides would respond, Amen. We went through that the other day. Well, this is, this, this is the same kind of response to that prayer. And then thirdly, they would have the reading of a passage from the Pentateuch. That's that three-year cycle, so they could read through the entire law of Moses. And whatever the passage was for that day, it would be read first in Hebrew. Now remember that by the time Jesus comes along, we saw in that intertestamental period, they had been through several exiles. And during the, the Hellenistic period, the Greeks were in charge. They changed the language of the people from Hebrew to Greek. That's why in the Old Testament you find it written in Hebrew. And when you come to the New Testament... It's written in Greek or Aramaic. So it had to be translated. So many by this period of time, you're talking hundreds of years, some of these generations, they could not speak Hebrew. They did not fully understand the, the scriptures in Hebrew. 
So when they were read, immediately following the reading, there would be a translation into Aramaic. And then it would be followed by reading from the prophets. That's the other books of the Old Testament. So when they read the prophets, they would also be translated. And then finally you'd have the teacher who was assigned for that day, which the teacher, like I said, is not a full-time teacher in many of these places. It could be an elder that would be approved. It could be a guest preacher like Paul and Peter. When they would go and travel around, they had a certain fame about being a teacher and preacher. So if they were in the synagogue that day, they might come to them and say, hey, do you have a word you could share with us? And they would get up and preach and preach, not only go from the Old Testament scriptures, but then introduce them to Christ as the fulfillment of those Old Testament scriptures. So they would be the teacher, but the, the natural posture for teaching was to be seated. Now notice there in, uh, in verse 19, he finishes his reading to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, he gave it to the shazan, the, to the minister, and he sat down. So that didn't mean he got down from the pulpit and went and sat in the pew. That's what we would think, right? No, that means he sat down. He's now going to teach. Well, when he sat down, what did he do? All the eyes of the synagogue were fastened on him. That means they were attentive. Okay, what does he now have to say about the passage in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 that he just read? And why didn't he finish the passage? Why did he stop mid-sentence when he said to preach the acceptable day of the Lord? Because the next sentence talks about the day of judgment. And it goes on. Even that's not the end of the sentence. It keeps going on in Isaiah. But the next phrase tells us why. And he began to say unto them. That means this is not all he said. He said a lot more than just this. But he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, fulfilled in your ears. What we just read in scripture from Isaiah some 600 years earlier, he said, I'm the fulfillment of that. When he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, that's, I'm the one that he's talking about. And he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. And then he goes and then he gives a summary of what his life and ministry on earth would be. We're going to look at that in detail on Sunday. So he sat down to teach and their eyes were focused. They were anxious to hear his word of teaching and exhortation. And then they would close with a benediction. A priest would, re would, would pray if he were there. If not... Uh, it would be substituted by a benediction by one of the elders. So this kind of gives us an idea of what the synagogue was, where Jesus ministered. But let me close with this application on this part. While it may just seem like te technical information, it is important context for understanding the life and ministry of Christ. But I want you to look at that one phrase. As his custom was. On the Sabbath day, which was their day to worship the Lord, the day that was set aside then, the church, once the Lord Jesus came, was crucified, buried, rose again on the first day, and then the church began on that Pentecost. The church began worshiping on Sunday. They set that day aside to be the day of the Lord. And to worship on that day. That's been our practice pretty much ever since. There are exceptions. There are some places where Christians are a small minority, a persecuted minority, and the countries do not observe Sunday as a separate day. They'll have, like in the Muslim world, many will worship on Thursday nights or Fridays, which is the Muslim holy day of prayer. But most of them are forced to work on Sundays. That's the first work day of the week, so they cannot meet as a church in many of these places on a Sunday. But the Lord Jesus, he is the king of glory. And as he comes to, to the earth, becomes man, grows up, and he would have gone with his father to the synagogue. The women would also go, and they would have the, the balcony where the women would sit. And he had heard the scriptures read. Now, I, I tried to imagine, how, how do you sit back as the, the incarnate word and hear the scriptures read and know every, every last bit about it, more so than the person reading or teaching. 
But he had done this. And when he came to public ministry, his custom on the Lord's day, the Sabbath day, was to be in the house of the assembly, the synagogues around where the people of the, met, around the word, and there he would teach. What an example. You say, did Jesus need, did he didn't need to be there for spiritual? He was there and he set an example for us as believers. The place to be when the appointed time was to be in the Lord's house. That's where he was. And that's where he taught. That's where he did many different signs and miracles. But also that's where he was persecuted by the Jews who rejected him. So was Paul and Peter and others. But many from those synagogues, they were holding on to the Old Testament religion, which were the scriptures. But they were missing the Messiah who had come. And many of those trusted, but most did not. But in this, when we come to a passage where it says he went to the synagogue, it's, an, it's easy to just skip over that word and all that information. But he gives us two examples just in this first part, the power and the place. Later we'll see the preaching and the persecution. But when you look at the power, how do we as Christians live? By the example of Christ and the power of of the Spirit. How do, how do we go about, what place do we go about when it's the Lord's day? and Where do we do the teaching and learning from the scriptures and worshiping? In the Lord's house on the appointed day at the appointed time with others of like faith. So he set an example and a tone for us that I think it would do us well to mimic and to obey considering that it is a command in the book of Hebrews. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, the, these details that in reading and just reading and skimming over it, we might miss the profoundness of this. But Lord, how we see in the life of Christ, the second person of the Godhead, who came and became man to reveal the Father to us, to reveal the good news of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and how our sins can be forgiven and washed away by the blood of Christ. He came to set an example and atone for how our lives should be when we become a child of God. Lord, as we look at this seemingly introductory passage by the writer Luke, it, it is a profound passage for us because it already sets a tone at the very beginning for how we too ought to live and how we too ought to behave as Christians in those things that you have set aside for us to do. Apply your word and as we come back next time and we look at the powerful message there from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Teach us, Lord, through your word and help us to live accordingly as a result. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.